Welcome to the friendly Westwood Village Rotary Club. <clears throat> the four-way test of the things we say or do. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it Chris, you're on mute. Yep, yeah, I just saw that. The four-way test of the things we say or do. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? I used to think about the four-way test every time I had an IRS audit. <laughs> and uh, I did my very best on all four attributes. Next. Nancy, will you lead us in pledge? Sure. Please put your hand over your heart and join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, next. Nancy, you're getting popular in, at this, uh, at the thought or, of the day. Looking forward to least, hearing it. Or at least my name is. Yeah. <laughs> Our name is. Yeah. I'd like to refer back to last week when our country honored Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. for his contributions to uh, advancements in our society and uh, his actual birthday was January 15th. We honored him, his life's work on January 16th. He was born Michael King Jr. in 1929. His father, as most of us know, was also a minister. He had been sent on an international tour by his church in 1934, which took him to Nazi Germany. And there he also visited a number of sites that were associated with Martin Luther King, which moved him so deeply that on returning home, he changed both his and his son's first and middle names to Martin Luther in the reformer's honor. I'd like to mention several inspirational quotes by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. Faith is taking the first step even when you don't see the whole staircase. And our scientific power has outrun our spiritual power. We have guided missiles and misguided men. Thank you. Thank you. Ed, will you lead us in song? I don't see Ed on. All right. Gordon has the next best voice in the Rotary Club. I think you need to unmute. Gordon, you got to unmute. No, stay muted. Yeah. You're still muted. <laughs> How's that? Better. Better. I, I do not want to sing a solo over the internet, but uh, if people can join, we can sing something. Sure. Let's do it. So let's unmute and try to sing God Bless America. Okay. Okay. <laughs> we can do that. Steve, you would like to sing, right? All right. Gordon, but isn't it isn't it right. army God goes wrong? Bless America. Land and I love free. Stand beside her and die through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the prairie to the oceans. 
that I can introduce? Well, Sarah's on. I don't know if that... Sarah, please say hello. Hi, yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah. I am the Vice President of Road Rat Club at UCLA. And it's a pleasure to see all of you again in person and, on and online. Um, we're going to have a joint collaboration with Westwood Rotary and West LA Homeless this Saturday, and I hope to see all of you there. I'm looking forward to seeing you. And uh, uh, Sarah, tell the club what is one of your hobbies that you're taking right now. One of the most recent hobbies that I've picked up is kickboxing and boxing. Um, and it is definitely quite the workout. I have definitely felt stronger over the past few weeks now that I've been doing it. And just kickboxing, are those front side uh, back kicks or what do they teach you? There's front kicks, there's side kicks, and then there's also like the roundhouse kicks. Right. Um, and then like in terms of like the arms that you learn how to do like your jabs, your crosses, your straights, and like your uppercuts and how to dodge them as well or block them. I'm going to make a request, Steve, that you put her on my team for protection for Saturday. <laughs> I This is just for self-defense. I don't think you could do anything. Well, like that, we're, not gonna, we're not going to attack anybody. <laughs> They're only I'd say for protection. Mm. I think right. I think Saturday should be fine though. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I think I'm, so too. I'm just kidding. Uh, Steve, did give you us learn, did you learn your sidekick from Ed McMahon? She wouldn't know who Ed McMahon is. Okay, sorry. Sure. Forget it, Gordon. <laughs> yeah. Um Steve Day, uh tell us once more what's gonna happen on this Saturday. I, I'm not sure I know what you're talking about, Chris. <laughs> anyway, yes, thanks, Chris. We're going to have our West LA Homeless and West, we'll, uh, Westwood Village uh, Club joint project, Clean Up Westwood. We'll be cleaning up from essentially uh, on Cottoner Avenue, going north uh, from Olympic and south from Ohio. We have at this time, believe it or not, 37 people signed up. Not just, and, and in addition to that, the three or four people from West LA Homeless. So we're going to have about 40 people. The good, the great news is we have plenty of tools. I'm actually going to pick them up from Sean tomorrow. So we have plenty of tools. And and I have, I've have i I've got the yellow vest, so there's enough vests to go around. Um, remember, Rotarians, bring your hats and your shirts, wear your uh, Westwood Village regalia, whatever you got. Um so let's see now, what else did I want to share? Oh yeah, make sure you bring your gloves. Uh, yeah. If you have gloves at home, uh, bring them, yeah. wear sh sturdy shoes. We're going to be in teams. Uh, probably because of the numbers we have right now, we'll probably have five or six teams of six or seven people per team. Uh, my plan is to uh, re uh, pre-populate uh, um, the teams. And my goal is, my, the way I'm doing it is I'm not putting all Rotarians together or all Rotor actors together or all volunteers. I'm um, I'm mixing it all up so we have a chance to meet new people as we're doing the cleanup. Uh, like I said, 37 people, of which 13 are Rotarians. We still have uh, space. We can take uh, any Rotarians who have not yet signed up. And as a reminder, the following Rotarians have signed up. Uh, Chris Gaynor, myself, Ben, Gordon, John O'Keefe, Nancy Cohen, Jim Crane, Sherrod Hansen, David Stover, Mark Rogo, Marsha Hunt. Marsha, you mentioned you were coming late, but please come. And then Aaron Donahue. Aaron, on top of that, has gotten four volunteers through the YMCA, which is awesome. Um, and uh, as Sarah, I think, mentioned earlier uh, before I jumped on uh, regarding the the, um, the 10 rotor, uh, rotor actors who are coming. So and we're even have from last week, you might remember, we had one of the Rotary Scholars there, Riku. 
and he's going to participate. So all in all together, we have 37 people signed up right now. And again, please let me know if you want to go Rotarians. There's several of you who haven't told me. So please let me know. Use the chat function here or contact me after the meeting. So again, this is going to be awesome. We're going to do a lot of good. It's going to be a chance for us to get out in the community. We're going to have uh, visibility. Um, and what I plan on doing later is I'm going to send around a video that Sean McMillan, the, the executive director, chairman of homeless, West LA Homeless, sent out earlier today. He did a... I'm not sure through what uh, what medium, whether it was Facebook or Instagram or wherever, but I, he sent me a, um, a text with it attached. So I want to send that out later to show you what Sean's up to. Great guy, very motivated, doing great work in the community. So anyway, any questions out there from anybody about tomorrow? Again, nine o'clock, we're meeting up at West uh, Westwood not Transitional tomorrow, Village, and we're going to have donuts and coffee. Don't drink too much coffee, or guys, eat all the donuts you want, but don't drink too much coffee. The only bathroom that we know of is there's a seven or excuse me a uh, starbucks on cottoner and and uh santa monica we might be able to sneak into but other than that you know just be cognizant um so anyway that it's, i think we're gonna have a wonderful event again this is something we want to do on a monthly basis so at some point chris and ben and i and uh, whoever else wants to give us their insight we're going to plan next month's cleanup will we be in the exact same space i don't know but that's something for us to discuss Questions, Ben, I think. By the question? way, I'm going to make a statement. It is not tomorrow, it's Saturday. Oh, gosh. Okay, I was thinking, no, no, it's yeah, okay. Saturday, Saturday, Saturday. Uh, January 28th, 9 o'clock, meeting at the Westwood Transitional Village. And again, thank you to Diane for allowing us to use the, the parking lot. And if the parking lot is full, it might be full because there's so many people coming. And if you can carpool, that's a great idea. Uh, park on the street. You can park just on the street along Sepulveda. There's plenty of parking there. Yeah. Gordon, you have a question? You're muted. I just was going to ask Mark if you want to say anything about the gloves. Mark Rogo, Steve Day, Mark was going to uh, pick up some gloves at the hardware store. Well, I've gotten 20 pair of gloves. So I'm not sure, Mark, you might want to get some for future cleanups or maybe if we have to, if enough people... Don't bring the gloves tomorrow, but I have 20 pair of them now. So if, if Mark, you want to get a, a, another dozen or so, that'd be awesome. But okay, we have I'm, I'm going to Pioneer Hardware after here for another, another reason, Steve. So I'll pick sure. up a, a dozen mediums and larges. Does that make sense? Yeah, I was able to find these uh, three packages of 12 gloves. They're 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 uh, uh, puncture uh, resistant. They're, they're 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 good. If you can find those, I think they're called. Um, oh. I had a pair here, matter of fact. I was gonna oh, here they are. They're called uh this isn't the exact one, but they're similar to this. They're called firm grip. I got them at Home Depot, but I'm sure wherever you're gonna go, Mark, they'll have gloves. So Steve, um, Sarah's yes. asking a question. She oh, wants sure. to make sure that the rotaracts are counted in the count for the 10 pair of gloves. They are. I yeah, they're definitely they they're set. And then we I got the extra 10 so that if other members, if, if members of the club um, aren't able to get a pair or don't have a pair or just plum forget about it, which is fine. We'll have another 10 pair plus the pairs. If Mark gets another 10, uh, 10 pair or so, we're going to be fine. But again, this is something we want to do uh, again next month. At, or at last, so I'm hoping next month and every month I'm um, going out. And again, I don't expect everybody to attend every, every cleanup. I understand things are on people's calendars, but you know, I like people to um, participate in future cleanups as well. And also other events that the club, other um, other projects, other community projects that I know Aaron has some ideas and others have some ideas about maybe things at the, uh, over at Uni High, regarding the Tongva site on uh, the VA property, the a project there made with Music Men's Minds is starting up there and our, we can help with that. Um, yeah, there's a lot. And, and again, the idea is, should come from us all. If you have an idea, let, let Aaron or let uh, Chris know what you have in mind for a cleanup project so we can get people bought into this. Because one of our goals, besides being in the community, is also starting that impact club, getting people who want to be Rotarians, who just can't come to weekly meetings, um, involved in Rotary and, and, and their club, or they would be part of our club, actually, but their, their satellite aspect to our club would be service projects. 
But we got to have okay. the projects. We got to have the projects. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Right. Uh, right. Ben, tell us about February 11th. So February 11th, uh, an exciting event. It looks like we're going to have over 20 people. Uh, my daughter and my son-in-law to be are coming. Uh, so we're going to meet. Uh, let's. It, we're starting the tour at 1030. So let's meet in the lobby and I'll give you, tell you the tickets will be there waiting for us at 1015 with, so that we're ready to go at 1030. Uh, we're going to have Barbara, who's the VP there, who spoke to our club, give us a, she'll be our docent for two hours. And I, she has so passionate about this museum. We're going to see things that maybe she wouldn't normally, we wouldn't see on a normal basis. So, and then, and then after 1230, we're gonna head over to Cantor's and I would appreciate those that have RSVP'd, let me know if in fact, you are planning to have lunch with us afterward so I can change the res, I made a reservation for 15 people. If it's more, we can add more. And Sarah, um, you're more than welcome as our guests to come to this museum and uh, and uh, to um, to Canners, we'd like you to be more involved with our group. So it's at it's at the Academy Award Museum. So I will send you the information. Oh, okay? Sounds like a fun event. I'm looking forward to it. And it's going to be sort of a Valentine's theme. That's all I'll say. <laughs> Good. Okay. All right. Um, how many of you know who UCLA is playing tonight in basketball at 6 p.m.? Sarah does. Sarah, who's, who are they playing? They're playing the wonderful USC, and it's going to be a wonderful. Great what do you mean the wonderful USC? Mm -hmm. You can't cool. down. You can't down talk the. You can't down talk the opposing team. You got to show respect. It's good sportsmanship. <laughs> We agree. It's going to be a very uh, tough game. Uh, UCLA barely squeaked by with a victory the last time they met in Poly Pavilion. However, this time they've got a seven foot center uh, that's been activated. And um, though he's only averaging 14 to 15 minutes a game, he's scoring 12 to 14 points a game. And being seven feet, you really clog up the middle. So I'm going with a good friend, and we're going to take the Metro to Galen Center tonight. So I am keeping a positive outlook. Tom, Barron, do you have anything you want to add? No, not really. Uh, the Pac-12 championships are coming up, and I expect UCLA to be in heavy in the mix, and uh, we'll see what happens. But um, – they didn't play that well against Arizona. Couldn't couldn't hit a basket to save their life. So we'll see. Yeah, and yet they uh, were able to come within four points within the last 30 seconds. So we'll Chris, see. Uh, Phil Gabriel's got his hands up. Oh, Phil, please. I, I have a question or a, I don't, I'm not sure what you want to call it. Uh, I don't know if this is the appropriate place to bring it up. But if it's not, then maybe we can do an offline discussion somehow. But I'm really um, kind of upset that we have not visited, we visited using Adelphi Greek as our meeting place. Um, they have plenty of room for us. The food's much better than any place we've ever been. And I think I think we're, and I don't know, I don't know the reason why we don't want to give Ruth a business. He's not making a lot of money on that. He might make five bucks a head after everything's said and done. And I, I just don't know the reasoning behind why we're not using them. I know right now there's no parking, but the restaurant across the street or the, the market across the street is opening soon, so there will be parking. And just for the life of me, I just, I don't know what the reason is that we mm -hmm. have not gone back there and not using them, using him on a regular basis. And it's a little bit upset because I, Guido's was very cramped and food wasn't very good as far as I was concerned. and. The new place, the seating is kind of all over the place. People are sitting behind pillars and different parts of the room. And I just, we, we haven't had really an open discussion about this in a very long time. I 
the the board has talked about it and it's probably best if you and i have an offline discussion on it going forward so okay, after the meeting so I'll, I'll be more than happy to discuss uh what was mentioned and you and i can talk at length okay do you want to call me this afternoon sure All right, that's it. That's all I have. Okay. Um, Tom Barron, will you please introduce our guest? Sure. Um, I met Joe years ago, as his wife is that was a classmate of my daughter's at UCLA, and she was actually on the dance team. And so uh, Joe got lucky and uh, married his wife, Gloria, and, and I've <clears throat> known him for years and appeared at my daughter's house. In a recent... Um, meeting at our house or at my daughter's house she and dan i talked to joe about um certain things and up came climate change etc and it was almost instantaneous and i realized that joe knew, knew more about energy than i'll ever hope to know so uh i asked him i said gee joe uh why don't you come and speak to rotary and give us some of your um some of your knowledge and information so he agreed to do that, and uh, Joe has uh, spent almost 30 years of experience in the traditional power generation, clean tech, EV, which some of you don't know, electric vehicle, charging, and most recently, environmental commodity industries. He has spent most of his career working on new technologies and emerging markets. This has required him to stay aware of the technologies and um market forces, driving changes in the in energy industry. Today, he's going to speak about a very hot topic. It's hard to read the no news and not see something about energy prices, climate change, or energy security. Unfortunately, it has also been a divisive topic and doesn't need to be. Listen to that. Divisive topic, topic and doesn't need to be. Our electric a grid has been going through significant changes with the increase in renewable energy, the decrease in uh, coal production and the shuttering of nuclear power plants. In the end, the strongest and most economically attractive grid is through diversification. Mr. Cannon, Joe, will look at some of the recent changes and provide an insight into what we expect in the coming year. Joe, you're up. Welcome to the Westwood Village Rotary Club. I hope he's on. Thank you, Tom. There we go. I I, I, uh, I shut down my video just to uh, conserve bandwidth since I'm in a little bit more of a remote location. But thank you, Tom. Uh, yes, I'm going to try to switch now to uh, sharing a screen. Hopefully this works. Let me know if this comes up. Okay, it's coming on, Joe. There you go. Okay, great. I'm going to go ahead and hide my video then because uh, nobody really needs to look at me. Um, so today I was going to be uh, discussing, as Tom said, kind of the evolving energy considerations and looking forward to our grid as it's transitioning. Um, as Tom mentioned, uh, it's a topic that uh, gets a lot of political concern but doesn't really – warrant it in the end. Uh, um, sorry, I'm trying to page down. There we go. You're back to the first slide, Joe. Um, there there we go. go. So just, a, yeah, there we go. I was having a hard time that my page down button's not working for some reason. Anyway, um, so about me, uh, as Tom mentioned, I've been in the energy industry for about 30 years in various aspects. I actually started my career at GE, fresh out of college, um, with an engineering degree, engineering degree in hand, and I went to work with uh, General Electric on fossil fuel power plants. So I worked on coal power plants and natural gas power plants primarily. Um, after uh, working with GE, I went back to school for my MBA, and after a couple of years, uh, joined Boeing's Energy Systems Group, which uh, was um, using Boeing's technology and their engineering and scientific capacity uh, to generate uh, terrestrial energy systems. So leveraging some of the stuff that they learned in space 
and bringing it down to uh, terrestrial systems here on Earth. Uh, we worked on projects like clean coal initiatives and other fossil fuels with gasification, um, but also we were working on renewable energy. So we were uh, the first company to do large scale power towers using the uh, mirrors to focus sunlight energy on a tower and generate um, electricity from that. You'll now see some of those plants in uh, on the way to Vegas. You'll see some on the north side of the freeway there. That technology hasn't really taken off yet, but um, it was a, a technology that was kind of in a demonstration phase. Um, since then, I continued uh, in solar power, uh, working for Empire Solar Solutions, and um, also worked in demand management, so helping with energy efficiency and trying to reduce um, our energy use. And currently, I've spent the last 10 years working in electric vehicles, most recently uh, in environmental commodities, so working with... Uh, companies that are electrifying to uh, capitalize on the environmental commodity market opportunities and working with state and federal regulators. Um, so that's a little bit about me. As Tom said, uh, there's a lot of attention right now given to the grid and the significant changes that are going on. It's, I don't think you can open a newspaper today and not see a headline about uh, the environmental impacts of uh, of our grid, uh, the grid reliability, new technologies that are coming around, you know, cost effectiveness or cost impacts, you know, price increases, and unfortunately, a lot of this uh, kind of follows a, a lot of politics. Um, today's discussion, um, I'm going to be looking beyond the headlines to see how the electricity industry is really changing and how should it change. Um, when I first came out of school and got into energy, everyone was uh, kind of like, well. That doesn't seem very exciting. And now it's actually a topic of conversation. As, as Tom mentioned, we were at a cocktail party and uh, and started talking about uh, climate change and uh, the grid and, and what what is the uh, implications going forward. So what is really happening right now? On the left here is a breakdown, and I'm going to be really focusing on the electric grid. So we have a lot of different energy uses from uh, liquid fuels in our vehicles to electric, you know, to uh, to our homes. and um, But I'm gonna be focusing on the electric grid. On the left is kind of a historic look from 1950 to the 2020 timeframe, showing how the mix of fuels has changed. Um, you'll see that orange line is coal. And around the 2000, a little after 2000, it really started to drop. Uh, at the same time, and some of the biggest changes since 2000, you'll see that coal dropped and it was increasingly replaced by natural gas. Natural gas is where we get most of our electricity today. Um, at the same time, there was also a growth in renewables. You can see that the uh, um, the other thing that's gained a lot of attention is nuclear, basically flattened out and has remained flat since then. Um, now, there's a as far as those changes, the drop in coal power and the increase in natural gas, a lot of that was driven by technologies economics, and environmental uh, regulatory policy. And so that's what was driving those changes. Nuclear was pressured down with the, has been pressed down or not to grow by the closure of a large number of power plants, but we are starting to see some new additions. And so you'll see, uh, you know, that, that nuclear gets a, a fair share of headlines, even outside of the, uh, the big ones, like the uh, recent announcement that they actually got positive energy out of fusion. So, um, Looking forward, I don't factor in the fusion, but on the right-hand side is looking where is energy going? And one of the key takeaways from this is that natural gas continues to grow, renewables continue to grow, um, the uh, nuclear remains flat, but still is in existence. Coal kind of continues to drop, but is still in existence. And one of the things that I really see and uh, look at is this gives a nice diverse energy mix. So right now we have power from a lot of different sources and uh, and that's gonna be increasing. That There's gonna be more and more uh, grid resiliency as we adopt a diversified energy mix. We aren't gonna be as a subject to uh, economic impacts from one commodity getting out of pace with the others. Now, looking at the shift from coal to natural gas, there's there's been uh, recent pressures to try to keep coal around and uh, it's it's 
the interesting thing about that is when you look at it from 2011 to 2019, 121 coal power plants were repurposed to burn other types of fuels. So we've been moving away from coal. Um, in the top right there is actually a picture of one of the first power plants I worked at, which is in Coal Strip, Montana, which has been downsizing and is shutting down. And um, that shift has been driven by stricter environmental emission standards in part, um, but also heavily by the lower priced uh, natural gas. So natural gas recently really went up with the uh, war in Ukraine, but it, in the last month, it has really come down significantly. And so um, natural gas continues to be kind of the low price leader. Um, there's also new technologies. So uh, it used to be that natural gas was just burned through a straight gas turbine. Now there's what's called a combined cycle power plant. And those have been around for a while now where the boiler, where they used to dump coal into a boiler, burn it and generate steam from the boiler. Now they're doing combined cycle power plants where a gas turbine takes natural gas, generates electricity from the turbine. But that hot gas from the uh, gas turbine then goes through a hot reheat steam generator. Uh, just They basically make steam from it. And then that steam is fed into uh, a steam turbine. So frequently that same turbine that was used in the coal power plant is now being repowered um, so that they're using natural gas and gas turbines and then using the hot exhaust gas to uh, to replace the coal boiler. And so those are much more efficient. And it turns out that they're actually not just higher efficiency, but they have lower generating costs because of the lower cost of gas and that higher efficiency. They're increasingly dispatchable. Dispatchable means that when the grid fluctuates, when grid need, when there's a higher need for electricity, that there's power plants that can be ramped up or ramped down, that uh, the flexibility of a gas turbine and a combined cycle power plant is much higher. So it better meets the utilities needs. Um, there's also a lot more flexibility in plant sizing and, uh, and siting. Um, on the right hand side there uh, with the picture labeled Crockett, that's a power plant that I was an engineer on um, you know, when we were doing the installation for GE. And that's a small cogen unit. You might notice that there's just in the background, there's some train tracks. This plant was shoehorned up in Crockett, uh, California, up in the Bay Area to fit on a little tiny piece of land that was available. And this plant is a uh, cogen. So it has the gas turbines, a steam turbine, but it also actually takes some of the steam off of the low pressure uh, side and feeds it into the uh, sugar plant that's here. There was an existing sugar facility and they use that steam for um, uh, process steam for the, uh, for the plant. But it really gives a great example of you can squeeze these things into a busy commercial area and into very small pieces of land and get generation. But also then they have lower emissions. So it's, it's, it was pretty much inevitable that we were gonna be shifting from coal to natural gas. It's not politically driven, it's technology driven and resource driven. And there's just too many benefits to natural gas not to, uh, to move that way. Now, the other big trend that, uh, that we showed was that boom in renewables. And we're seeing that we are continuing to get a, a big push in renewables. Um, wind and solar capacity accounted for about 60% of the new generation capacity added in 2022. And that's accelerating. Um, a lot of the drivers for this, uh, one of them is government support. There's incentives and tax credits. The uh, recent IRA expanded these. Um, but that government support, uh, the interesting thing is it's not one side of the aisle. So when we look down below at the states that are capitalizing on renewable energy, you'll see that it's a good mix of what's red and blue states with Texas and Washington, California, Iowa, you know, these are the top 10 renewable energy producing states in the country. And um, so this appeals to and is being uh, utilized uh, by, by both sides. Um, and one of the reasons for that um, is that it, it, it makes a lot of sense. It, it's becoming increasingly attractive due to technology improvements. 
So there's increased capacity from existing technologies. There's approved efficiencies and there's lower costs. Um, if you look at the top right chart, that shows the trend of costs over time on what's called a levelized energy cost. And so it's based off of the full cost. Uh, basically, a uh, it captures the upfront capital cost, uh, the tax incentives, the um, operating costs, the feedstock costs. And you can see that since 2009 and latest to this year's is 2018, that natural gas, PV, utility scale, photovoltaic, solar, and wind are now some of the lowest cost electricity we have. Gas is actually a little bit higher than the uh, renewable energy costs. But one thing to keep in mind is that gas is dispatchable, which means that it's going to be available whenever the utility needs it. And so it carries a higher value to the utility. And uh, wind and solar are less dispatchable, but they cost less. So they're nice for incremental loads and for, uh, for lowering the overall cost of electricity. Um, but what it really speaks to is that we have three good sources now of power with supplemental power coming from coal and nuclear for base load, that it really creates a nice mix for our grid. Um, some of the other factors that are impacting uh, you know, this shift to renewables are the ESG or the environmental and societal uh, kind of factors, the social pressures. We're seeing more and more companies and more and more entities move this way. Um, we actually see that there's a, a thing called the carbon markets where people are buying carbon credits and there's a regulatory where ent entities are required to buy carbon. And then there's a voluntary market and we're seeing more action, more activity on the voluntary market where companies are buying carbon credits just to uh, kind of meet their, their ESG goals and their social goals um, than is even being mandated. Uh, one of the other technologies that's going to really help improve this is storage technologies. And we're going to see more and more developments around electricity storage, um, especially associated with uh, things like the electric vehicle and um, technologies that are developed in parallel with that, that are going to make the value of solar and wind energy higher so that um, there's going to be a shift towards that. But one of the interesting things is looking down at the lower right, um, is that on the, the left side of that chart with the dots, you see that the cost of uh, power going out to 2040 still remains in that kind of that same basic mix where coal is, a or I'm sorry, natural gas is a little bit more expensive than the two renewable sources. But if you look at the right, in 2025 to 2027, by far the largest investment and the farthest, the most capacity additions is gonna be in natural gas. And so we see that it's kind of moved, it's gonna be in the near term, uh, solar volt photovoltaics, so solar power. Then it kind of moves to natural gas. And by the time we get into the 2038, 2020, 2040 uh, timeframe, it's a nice mix. We have natural gas, we have solar, we have wind. It's really kind of where the grid has matured or has, uh, incorporated these new technologies and is uh, kind of furthering that diversification. Now, one of the topics that gets a lot of attention is nuclear power. Um, it's faced a significant amount of public backlash uh, with uh, some of those high profile incidents, you know, with Fukushima and Chernobyl and Three Mile Island, um, and then the concerns over what happens with nuclear waste. But recently it's become actually uh, espoused by some of the environmental community because of uh, it is uh, low emissions. It has zero CO2 emissions. And so there's, there's weighing, well, you have risks, but you have the upside against a known risk of the CO2 emissions. And so there's become more and more attention to how do we go about capitalizing with nuclear power? Is that a source that we want to look at? Um, new construction of the traditional large plants um, has, you know, there hasn't been a new plant in 30 years in the U.S. And that's hampered by the high cost, the capital cost to build a large plant like that are significant. There's the public fears, which also generate then siting issues along with the uh, siting issues just associated with uh, having sufficient 
water available and things of that nature. Um, but then there's also grid integration issues. Um, those large plants are frequently a uh, gigawatt plus in size. And uh, so that one on the right there is Diablo Canyon. I worked on a large power plant in Moss Landing up by Monterey, California. And one of the big reasons that that was built, it was two uh, 750 megawatt units, I believe, um, was to provide backup power when they had to do maintenance on Diablo Canyon. And so you have to, if you have a large power plant like that, that's subject to being brought down uh, occasionally, um, you have to have backup power for it. And so, um, so that creates a lot of difficulties in creating these new uh, large power plants. But there's alternative technologies on the, uh, the radar that are showing a lot of promise with smaller modular reactors um, that are, uh, they're smaller, they're easier to site, they're easier to control, they take advantage of new technologies. And then there's the fourth generation reactors that we're starting to see with things like molten salt. Um, we're also starting to see, there's a big issue right now where they're looking at longer term operation. They're looking at extending the life of some of the plants that are out there. A uh, good case is Diablo Canyon that's shown there. Um, they were looking at shuttering it in 23 and 24, the uh, the two units there. Um, but now there's a push to extend that. Um, it's actually the most cost effective because all the capital costs are already, for the most part, uh, addressed. That it's actually the most cost effective means uh, for maintaining power right now. And the NRC has, uh, you know, done its study, and they feel that the, there's minimal risks. Besides, despite all that you hear about there being an earthquake fault nearby and the the you know potential hazards, uh, they've decided that it's deemed to be a reasonable risk. This is a good example of where um, you can cross the aisle. Um, the extension of Diablo Canyon is is being espoused by our governor. Uh, a Democrat, and also by many of the Republicans in office in uh, in Sacramento. And so, you know, it, it's great to be able to look at this, you know, just from a cost and from a risk and from a scientific and a technology standpoint and say, no, it might make sense to continue operation of this plant while some of these other sources come up and uh, become an increasing share of the market. Interestingly, um, there has been a uh, recent more activity in nuclear. The first plants in the United States are going to be, new plants in the United States are going to be opened in uh, Georgia. Uh, Southern companies units, both three and four, are the, they're going to be opening in the next year, I believe. Um, those are going to be the first plants uh, that to be opened in the United States. And France and Japan recently announced that they're going to be doing more development efforts. France's was heavily tied to the impact of um, well, the uh, the war in Ukraine, um, but some of the other uh, influences and uh, the desire to have better grid stability and better predictability of electricity costs in uh, in Europe, and uh, so it's interesting to see that that nuclear does have a future, and, and if uh, and if those folks working on a, a cold fusion and uh, are able to make that work, boy, that's that's really the future. But that's that's going to be a number of years down the road. Now, one of the other big impacts on the electric grid is on the demand side. So I've been talking about the supply side and how that's changing. Um, but the other uh, thing that's got a big impact is the, um, the demand side. So we're hearing about electric vehicles. There's recently more and more talk about shifting to electric homes. They're talking about electric everything. We're now one of the things driving that is we're learning that uh, you know, the impacts of burning fossil fuels, uh, you know, the impacts of that aren't good. And uh, so we're, we're learning more about that and responding to that. We can't respond overnight. But as technologies present themselves, uh, it makes sense to capitalize on those. And we're starting to see those technologies developing. We've seen the electric cars starting to come onto the market. Electric forklifts actually uh, constitute a, a significant share of the material handling, handling industry now. Uh, ships, when they come into port, are plugged in for shore power rather than burning bunker fuel. Um, airplanes are even looking at different opportunities using either electric or fuel cells, which frequently the hydrogen is generated from electricity. So a lot of these technologies are driving increased uh, adoption or increased utilization of electricity. Um, 
in fact, um, on the electric vehicle side, um, we've seen, you know, a lot of the OEMs, the major OEMs are talking about converting primarily to EVs in the 2030s. So they're going to be shifting most of their manufacturing uh, to uh, electric vehicles with targets announced by Ford and GM of 2 million vehicles per year by 2035. Um, so we see on this chart to the right, um, kind of the share of market. Um, you know, as far as the amount of sales of electric vehicles, you can see that buses leads the way with, uh, you know, they're projecting getting up into the 80% range. Um, one of the things that I think has come about um, is that there's been all these major announcements about the conversion to EV. And everyone thinks, okay, well, that's the end of the gasoline engine. And you can see that even... It, um, looking at the, say, the light commercial line, which actually makes up the largest pool of vehicles in the U.S. Um, by 2040, we're still only looking at about 55 to 60 percent of the fleet uh, or of new car sales being um, electric. So I think that there's a lot of announcements, but it outpaces a lot of um, what actually a lot of people are expecting. So there's some doubts about the pace of conversion. Um, there's no doubt that, this, that the electric vehicle on a vehicle basis is a superior technology. The electric motor has higher efficiency than an internal combustion engine. It's got better ride. It's faster. It's got more torque. So it accelerates great. It's low noise. The maintenance requirements are very low. Um, and the manufacturability, the number of parts in an electric car is much less than an internal combustion car. But it does have its drawbacks and consumers are concerned about things like range and the existence of charging infrastructure, the cost of the vehicles and the amount of time it takes to charge. We're looking at, um, you know, how do we address those concerns? We're seeing more and more investment going into charging infrastructure. We're seeing that the range of the vehicles has increased significantly and new battery technology is driving that further. The costs are coming down and in fact, in uh, I think it's less than five years, the cost of an electric vehicle is supposed to be less unsubsidized than, uh, than an internal combustion engine. And charging times, um, as far as the charging time, frequently that's not a factor because it's instead of the kiosk model where we pull in and fill up at a gas station, now instead people are gonna be charging their cars wherever they're parked. You know, frequently, like I have an electric car and I charge it overnight at home and it actually saves me time. If I was to look at the amount of time I used to spend at a gas station over the term of a year, my charging time is much less because I just plug in at night and I don't have to do anything. Um, and so it's a kind of a change in mindset, but everything has to be appropriate for its given use case. Um, you know, you can't force... Uh, electrification of a vehicle or a use case vehicle that, that doesn't meet the need. So an example would be a long range truck. Right now, uh, short range heavy duty vehicles make a great amount of sense. And we're I work with uh, one of the largest retailers in the country and they're looking at using uh, electric vehicles, electric trucks for distribution. And they're looking at medium duty trucks for uh, end use, so fulfillment at home. And um, you know, the, the electric use profile works great, but move, moving goods across the country, it doesn't work so great right now. And so it's going to be a case of as range increases, as infrastructure improves, as technology warrants it, more and more use cases are going to fit the need for uh, electric vehicles. And so that's going to result in a replacement of the fleet, but it's going to take time. In the bottom right is a, a little bit of a pessimistic view, but if you look at the transportation sector on the far right, you can see that electricity by 2050 is just barely starting to, 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 uh, to make an impact, is barely starting to show up. So the challenges we face, this is my last slide. One of the challenges we face is the aging and inspection distribution infrastructure. We've heard a lot about do we have enough power on the grid to, to meet the needs? That's actually less of a concern. That chart to the right shows kind of the forecast for different economic uh, growth projections. How much power we need to add? It is not a ton of power. We actually have enough kilowatt hours 
A lot of it is having the kilowatt hours where and when we need them. And that's where we actually do need a significant amount of investment. The transmission developers expect to have about 6,000 miles in the next uh, few years. Um, we're actually looking at needing about 10,000 miles uh, with a lot of it being high voltage lines in order to meet uh, our, our electrification goals. So it is gonna take some investment, but not necessarily in um, generation so much as in distribution. Plus our distribution infrastructure is getting old, so we have to replace some of it. Um, but also we can just decrease some of that demand by increased focus on efficiency and distributed resources, which is a lot of technology is going into. Um, as far as economic energy independence and economic stability, we're starting to see that. And as we diversify um, this electric grid, it's actually um, great for independence because all electricity is mostly driven by local resources. Renewables are local. Natural gas, especially in the United States, is local. Nuclear power is local. And then diversification also makes us economically less susceptible to impacts or changes in any given one given commodity price. Uh, we saw some of the impacts to natural gas, but as uh, more and more renewables come online, even that will be mitigated. So uh, the diversification just makes sense from that standpoint. And then grid reliability and expanded capacity. Uh, one of the things uh, that electric vehicles create is increased demand for electricity, but it also creates a lot of flexibility. There's what they call V to G or vehicle to grid integrations, where they're gonna be able to use capacity in those vehicles as energy storage. So that when uh, you know, a vehicle could charge overnight, when there's plenty of power available, and on those days when there's brownouts or blackouts threatened, the vehicles, that fleet of vehicles can actually backfeed their power onto the grid and mitigate that risk. And so as that fleet expands, while it presents challenges as far as meeting new capacity, it also presents a lot of flexibility in how that capacity is, uh, is, is brought to bear on the, on the demand. And then we're gonna see increased expanded capacity with new renewables, natural gas and projects. I guess the real takeaway that I'd want to convey, and I'm happy to answer any questions, is energy transition is going to be going on at a pace driven by the market and by technology developments. And despite all the headlines we see, that politics is not going to be nearly as much as a driver as the market and the technology. And diversification and reasonable adaptation is going to continue to drive our grid. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to open it now uh, to any. Okay, Joe, this is Chris. Um, I, we have three electric vehicles in our household and I haven't gone to a gas station since 2013. And frankly, I've never missed not going, but it seems to me uh, that <clears throat> I'm just surprised uh, at the time frame for the electric vehicles to uh, be more in demand. Uh, everything I read and everything that's proposed out there talks about, you know, 2030 is is uh, going to be coming upon us, and for only 60 percent, 55 to 60 percent by 2050, I'm I feel like I'm missing something. Um, either the news is um, overly optimistic. Um, but you look at what Europe is doing and all the guidelines about no internal combustion engines after a certain period of time, and that's sooner than later. Could you comment on that, please? Yes. Yes, um, there's different projections out there. Um, some of them, I think, are factoring in potential changes in administration that that slow down the, uh, the development of this. Um, but keep in mind that the U.S., um, there's a couple of factors. One is we see a lot of electric vehicles in California, where we're about seven percent of the uh, the new car sales, or um, seven percent of the fleet. Um, but the rest of the country is actually not nearly as far along. Um, and we've seen, like just recently, Wyoming, it's not really got a potential to pass, but was saying that they were going to outlaw electric vehicles. So there is uh, resistance to and less adoption of electric vehicles. Um, now, one of the factors, you mentioned Europe. In Europe, 
the adoption of EVs is almost double or more what it is here. And they're far outpacing us. And even in Asia, they're far outpacing our adoption of electric vehicles. Um, but there's a couple of factors that have to be included in that. And uh, one of the big factors is their gas prices are significantly higher than here. And their commutes, their average vehicle use is uh, frequently about half of what we have. And so um, that, that chart showing the 60%, I think is pessimistic. There's a wide range of projections. Um, I work with a lot of the OEMs and they've said that they think that by 2035, they'll be selling about 2 million vehicles per year, uh, which right now they're selling about two and a half million per, uh, vehicles total per year. So they're anticipating that most of their production will be shifted over to that. But when you look at there being almost 280 million vehicles on the road and about 15 million being added per year or 15 million sales, it takes a while to convert that overall fleet. Um, I think a lot of the, the that data is is a little bit pessimistic. I think though um, that we will have um, that the uh, adoption of EVs will outpace what the EIA, the Energy Institute of America or Energy Industry, whatever, um, is projecting. So, no, I, I'm optimistic on the adoption of EVs, but I also think that the the press on the rate of adoption um, maybe exaggerates it a bit. Okay. Joe, Other I've questions? Got, Tom? I've got a question. Joe, it, it seems like natural gas is considered a fossil fuel. And a lot of the politicians are saying, we don't want any more fossil fuels, but you're showing that natural gas is gonna be predominant. I mean, and it's cleaner than coal, but nevertheless, it's gonna be a significant factor in production on through the next 20, 30 years. Is that correct? Yes, that's that's uh, kind of what the uh, the EIA, which, uh, you know, it's a Department of Energy um, is showing that they they anticipate that natural gas is going to continue that way. Um, one of the big reasons for that is we still need baseload electricity. Uh, one of the problems with renewables is their intermittency. So, um, you know, they, they aren't as predictable or can't be brought on necessarily as quickly um, to address the demand uh, that, a, that a, a lot of the traditional power plants can. So hydro being one exception, hydro is a base load uh, fossil fuel, um, or I'm sorry, uh, renewable energy. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're forecasting that natural gas will continue to have a significant share of the market, um, you know, going forward. Um, I think as energy storage improves um, and renewables coupled with energy storage, we could see that that projection revised downward. But um, my guess is that we will still have a significant energy mix while those newer technologies come on board. Okay, other questions? I've got another one if nobody else has one. Go ahead. Um, when it comes to electric vehicles, um, it seems to me that a lot of the publicity, at least, is the fact is that it's going to take a lot of uh, uh, cobalt and uh, um, and one of the big factors is graphite, and 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 that we haven't got the mining capacity to do that, to, especially when they say you want to eliminate all gasoline engines by 2035 or something. We can't get enough of the supplement. Uh, things that compose that are comprised in the battery. That's one of our problems, mining for all this. How are you going to overcome that problem? They're identifying one of the big uh, uh, material requirements is around like lithium. And so they're, the interesting thing is that they're identifying more and more of these resources um, as the need kind of comes to, comes to, um, comes to, be realized. So um, you might have seen like headlines that the Salton Sea happens to have a ton of lithium out there. And so I think what we're going to see is as there's the demand and as that demand starts to increase prices on those commodities, we're going to be finding more and more resources for that. Um, now, the question is going to be, can we find those resources in domestic production? Um, or are we going to have to go offshore for that, which you know would be counter to that energy security objective? 
um, the incentives that were put out are actually that uh, a lot of the batteries are manufactured in the U.S. and that the uh, the uh, materials for those batteries are increasingly sourced within the U.S. So there are initiatives to expand the mining capacity for those uh, rare earth metals and for those other uh, materials that are needed for the batteries. But yes, that is a concern and it is something that that is gonna have to be addressed. But um, I think it is one of those things that we can address. Um, the interesting thing is when you look at it, a lot of times that's brought up that, well, we have to source these materials from offshore locations. But when you look currently at uh, the materials that are being used in internal combustion engines, um, the steel industry in the U.S., the aluminum industry in the U.S. has been, you know, minimized or, you know, shrunken so much that most of those materials are coming from offshore as well. And so um, it's it's interesting that uh, that that we are pushing for increased capacity in the United States. Um, but but it is going to be subject to the availability of those resources. Okay. Any other questions before? Uh, I just wanted to say you put some sanity into all of this. Thank you, uh, Joseph, and thank you, Tom, for bringing him in. It's great. Yeah. Uh, Joe, greatly appreciated you taking the time out. It's a subject that's near and dear to all of us. So thank you, and... Uh, Perhaps we will call upon you during Steve's year and you can give us an update what's happening next year. That sounds good. I appreciate right. it. Thank you. Thank you so I'm much. Um, uh, next, um, it was nice to meet you guys virtually. Okay. Next week, I want to bring to your attention, uh, we have investment uh, day. Steve Shearer will be running the meeting and we are going to start very early. We will start the meeting at 12.30. I'm asking all of you to please come no later to Guido's by 12.15. We are dismissed. Thank you. By early. Okay. Chris, I think everybody should be there at 12 so that we can get that meeting and not be interrupted for such an incredible speaker. I'll so advise Guido's to serve the food by 12.15. All right, please do. Um, eh, come as early as you can. We'd love to have everybody by noon. Okay. Have a good week. And remember, go Bruins. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.